So, um, in fact, some of your commensal organisms will produce histamine directly um, as a postbiotic. So your microbes that live in your gut will actually produce histamine as well. Often it's a way of signaling to the immune system that there is a chronic infection or there's some sort of dysfunction in the ecosystem, right? So if you have if you have latent viruses, for example, that, that inhabit your system, long-term viruses like cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr, and so on, those types that know how to hang around for a long period of time without being detected by the immune system, those can trigger uh, microbes in the region to produce histamine. They do, they produce histamine, they produce things like um, taurine and other compounds to try to excite and attract the immune system to that side of action, right? So in some ways, histamine overexpression is also independent of the immune system creating it. It's also the microbes, but it's doing so because it's indicating a chronic infection, right? So that's, that's another driver of histamine um, uh, release. Now, the, that, the, that signals two problems, right? So one is that there is some sort of dysbiosis going on, meaning you've got an imbalance of microbes within the system. You might have some sort of latent infectious organism sitting there. So you've got, that is triggering other organisms to produce constant levels of histamine. Um, or you could also have pathogens or opportunistic pathogens that will produce histamine as a way of um, distracting the immune system from its presence, right? So certain opportunistic organisms do well under inflammatory conditions, and they try to elicit those inflammatory conditions by producing compounds that either A, will directly activate the innate part of the immune system, right, to, to upregulate inflammation, or B, produce molecular mimics to parts of your own cells and so on to activate the immune system and misdirect the immune system to a different target, right? So a lot of it comes down to that ecological problem of dysbiosis. Um, and these are systems in place to protect the host, but they pretty quickly go awry when you've got an imbalance of, of microbial activity in the system, right? So, uh, and it's also important to note uh, at this point, so your audience understands that the way we function, the way our immune system functions is our immune system is one of the only systems in the body that is constantly adapting to the environment, right? Um, the whole idea of the immune system is it's the on only immune system within ourselves that is directly designed to protect the host, which is us, right? However, the immune system functions differently depending on where you are, right? If you live in Mexico City, your immune system functions differently and has different tolerances than if you live closer to the Arctic Circle, right? Very different ecosystems, environments, different pathogens, different allergens, different food components, environmental components, and all that. So your immune system has to adapt to its ecosystem. And it's one of those systems that's constantly adapting because weather changes, right? Season changes, completely changes the antigens around you, right? That, that trigger immune responses. So your immune system is supposed to continuously adapt. The way the immune system adapts is it uses the microbiome as a translational tool. The microbiome provides the immune system signals on what is going on in the environment. The immune system on its own does not know how to read the environment that you're in and adapt to it. In particular, the idea of what to attack and what not to attack, right? Because as important as it is for the immune system to understand what is a pathogen and attack it and protect you from it, it's equally or arguably even more important for the immune system to not attack all of the myriad of things it, it encounters that it shouldn't be activated, right? So that tolerance is dictated in large part by the microbiome. Okay, amazing. So we've got endogenous production in immune cells. We've got microbes producing histamine as a kind of defense mechanism to help them survive. Um, one thing that I would love to kind of touch on is I guess moving into the idea of what is histamine intolerance then in regards to the an imbalance between this buildup and degradation. But before we do, is there are there any other mechanisms that um, we could highlight in regards to, I, I guess, basically SIBO and histamine? Because that's obviously quite a big conversation that 
people um, ask us around. There's a lot of information out there, but not much from a, an evidence-based perspective. So what's mm -hmm. your understanding and experience with um, sort of SIBO and histamine issues? Yeah, so, you know, um, histamine response is a default response in many cases when the immune system is ill-equipped to, to protect the host, right? So one example of that is when you have low levels of secretory IgA, right? You're, the way your immune system compromises uh, is it increases the amount of IgE, right? So when you don't have the B cells adequate enough to produce the IgA, and IgA should be constantly produced and changed based on what the microbiome environment looks like in the gut, right? The, your, these B cells are sampling what's happening in the ecosystem um, and, then, and then building tolerance to the microbes that are uh, living in your gut, but then building intolerance and, and, and direction towards new microbes that might come in. So the, so the IgA profile keeps changing. However, if you don't have enough of those cells of the B cells activated to produce enough IgA, what tends to happen is you tend to get more activation of basophils, isonophils, and all that to produce more IgE and, and histamine and allergic type of responses, right? That's kind of where your body goes as a default response to everything that's entering into the system. So when you look at somebody with SIBO, um, yes, there is the overgrowth part of it, right? So there's that small intestinal overgrowth. Um, that's a signal of dysbiosis. But ultimately what SIBO people have that really create that whole myriad of issues that they experience is they have severe leaky gut in their small bowel right? Because there's a taxa shift of organisms, you get more gram negative bacteria over time, you've got really high levels of bacteria that shouldn't be there, you're releasing more LPS into the environment. And so what's, what tends to happen is you tend to get a depression of proper immune activation, because you have the wrong bacteria, you have leaky gut, so you've got constant inflammation, and your secretory IgA levels will start to drop the B cells that are supposed to be activated by the microbiome, by a healthy, diverse microbiome, actually don't get activated. And so your body responds by recruiting more inflammatory cells like basophils, isonophils, with IgE histamine type of response to that region, right? And then now, because you're losing oral tolerance, right? Because you need that B cell that's making IgA to help you develop oral tolerance to the organisms that live in your, in your system. And you also need that healthy diversity and balance of organisms to upregulate the Treg system, which regulates all of the immune responses, right? You're getting a depression of both of those. So then the inflammatory histamine type of responses continue to escalate and they continue to be triggered by these new organisms that are living in your small intestine that typically shouldn't be there, right? So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. So you're feeling it through bloating and, and, and the inflammatory responses and the intolerance to food and all that, you feel that, right? But what's actually also happening is you're getting an, uh, a continuous perpetuation of this uh, dysfunctional immune response because the key ones, the IgA, the Treg responses are being suppressed. So it's a cycle, right? It just gets worse and worse. That, that dysbiosis will increase over time. Leakiness in the gut will increase. More inflammation, less IgA, less Tregs, and that means more IgE, more histamine, and so on. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot there. <laughs> There's a lot there. And, and, and the problem is then you develop this issue of what, we, what we're labeling as histamine intolerance. What that really means is that lots of things you eat rather than triggering a tolerance response, is triggering an inflammatory and immune response. And that immune response happens to be a histamine directed response because that's the part of the immune system that's now functioning to try to protect you, right? And you don't have the Treg system that's going, hey, we don't need to respond to this, turn it down, mm -hmm. right? So now we've got this constant inflammatory response to everything that you're being exposed to. And of course, some things will trigger a higher response than others, just on the nature of the antigen, uh, but but that intolerance, uh, it's, it's not necessarily an intolerance to histamine itself, right? It, it's not that somehow you've become allergic to histamine or histamine itself is the sensitivity. Histamine is the communication tool 
that the dysfunctional immune system is using to amplify response. Okay. And does this start to explain why um, studies where they've taken participants with IBS, which obviously is a, a diagnosis of exclusion, as we all know, um, you know, there's lots of research showing that there's this kind of migration of mast cells into the laminopropia or the gut lining, which so it's kind of almost a, a double whammy, it sounds like. That's exactly right, because what they show is that as you lose uh, diversity, the right type of diversity in, in the small bowel even, or in the large bowel, this is it's equivalent for both. Uh, and as you start to um, get a taxa shift of the wrong type of bacteria, so in a healthy small bowel, for example, you should have more gram-positive bacteria than gram-negative, right? Gram-negative bacteria tend to be at a relatively low level. Uh, but if you start getting this dysbiosis and increase in those microbes, you start getting lower activation of plasma cells and B cells to produce IgA. And because of that, it recruits in more mast cells and eosinophils and all that to try to replace the IgA uh, B cell protection that you normally have with this alternative, right? So it's a, it's a default way for your body to try to protect you. The idea probably from an evolutionary standpoint is that, hey, you need some protection there, right? Because that's the biggest source of incoming foreign material, right? It's going through your stomach and then the next spot is going through your small intestine. So you need immunological activity in that area. If you don't have the, the, the normal immunological activity, we're going to pull in whatever we can and it happens to be mast cells and so on. Um, so it's, it's all driven by this imbalance. But I think the good news here is that it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, you know, solidify that this is now how your body works, right? There is a way of balancing it out and, and bringing back the IgA, bringing back the active, the, the, the right plasma cells, bringing back the Treg system, and then diminishing the mast cells. Um, you know, so that, that I think is, is the most promising aspect of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess maybe that's a, a great way to, to conclude the conversation but if we if we back up a little bit before we start talking about some of how the, how we can um rebalance modify what you've been discussing um would it be okay i guess a just to touch on sort of dao and the role that that plays within the gut lining and how that can be compromised um which i guess again is a another element to this whole conversation mm -hmm. and then i guess how several things that you've been bringing up there, then connect back to the gut-brain axis and cognitive function. Right. Yeah. Um, well, so, uh, you know, let's start with the gut-brain axis and cognitive function, uh, which is quite, it's, it's such an interesting area. It's, um, it's really, um, I think, underappreciated by most people, especially when you look at people who are professionals dealing in psychiatric and mood disorders and all that, right? And it's it's evolving, it's coming around. I think um, the International Association of Psychiatric Physicians or something like that, I can't remember what the acronym is, uh, but in the last three, four years, they've had more and more keynote talks around the gut-brain axis. So I think it's, it's evolving, but um, obviously it's not quite there yet because gut-brain therapeutics are not the standard just yet, right? So um, what, what seems to be um, really clear, and this is a lot of this is from the research out of the APC in Cork Island, uh, which is one of the world's most renowned areas of research for gut brain access stuff. Um, what seems to be clear is there are um, inflammatory pathologies in the gut that occur in the lining and the mucosa um, and, the, and the, um, that translate into the lamina propria and then of course into circulation or through the enteric nervous system that then trigger um, inflammatory responses in the brain as well, right? And it does so by activating the HPA axis. Um, and one of the big problems there is you start to activate microglial cells in the brain. And microglial cells are the equivalent of macrophages in the rest of the body, but microglial cells kind of focus on the brain, but they have an interesting ability to upregulate something called TNF-alpha, which is a inflammatory cytokine, inflammatory.